Okay, well, uh, my name's Andrew. Uh, I'm a programmer once again. I was a programmer before and I was retired for a while. Uh, and uh, I got back into programming through discovering Haskell. Uh, and then I discovered PureScript and started doing some work for some people with PureScript. So one of the things that uh, I have been doing is uh, doing custom visualization work for complex user interfaces in using D3. Um, so that's using D3 visualizations as a kind of UI Chrome or kind of UI aspect. So you're, you're visualizing things in order that you have access to uh, data. So a very simple example, it could be what, uh, something like a call graph for a tree where you want to, you want to go to a particular uh, part of, of a call graph or a dependency layer and you click on it in, in a D3 visualization and it causes, some, it causes you something to happen somewhere else. Maybe an editor changes or something like that. So I, ca I can't demo that work because it's commercial, but um, the side effect of that is I started using PureScript D3, the original version written by Tom Crockett. Uh, which uh, I think that was the reason why I picked up PureScript because I, uh, I'd already been using D3 and I thought, oh, well, you, you know, you could really um, tidy up some stuff using that. But I quickly found when I used it in earnest, I found that uh, going for the kind of stuff we wanted to do, circuit callbacks and so on are just a, a kind of a no-no, you know, uh, using that. I think they're a no-no. I don't know of any way to make them work using that easy FFI eval kind of style. So I got interested in, well, I wanted to do a proof of concept for myself. So I did one where I, I was able to use uh, Harry's uh, effects, effectful functions library uh, to wrap everything up. And then that did enable me to make callbacks from D3 into PureScript, which is necessary because uh, there's a lot of callbacks in, in D3. There's a lot of, and you don't want to be writing very pretty PureScript DSL, and then have to drop out into the FFI in order to write every little lambda that does something like, well, I'll show you some examples in a moment, but uh, you want to be able to write little PureScript lambdas. Um, or basically, you want to write all your code in PureScript if you can. Uh, so I did that, but then I still wasn't satisfied with, with that. So I decided about to a week and a half ago to just throw it out and write it from scratch, uh, motivated largely by the fact that D3 itself has just gone to version four. Version four is a lot more modular. Uh, I didn't have time to, to turn this into, to turn this diagram. Oh, can you see, am, I, am I still on the screen? I'm probably just only sharing the screen. Do I, uh, it doesn't matter. No, I, have a, I have a diagram here that shows the, the, the dependency structure of the new D3. But the, the important point about it is that there's now 30 individual modules with certain dependencies between them. Uh, and they're, it's, it's not just a monolithic chunk of 800 uh, API endpoints. Um, so I think maybe I'll just talk for a moment about about visualization, just um, anybody who's in the chat um, wants to say whether they know some stuff about visualization or whether they're not interested, but I'm just going to speak for a minute or two. So um, there, it's a very big topic, right? And it's, it's, um, it's, it's kind of a specialist topic, even as we've become inundated with, uh, with visualizations of data. Um, D3 owes it, D3 success is that it's not like a library for producing charts of some kind or, or even, it doesn't really have canned visualizations at all. What it has is, is has an essential structure, which is about joining data to the DOM. And it, it, it what you're doing is defining how that happens. So I think it, it's, it's similar in a way to things like VDOM and React in that it's, it's, it's a way of talking about the DOM at, an, at a, a remove from it. Um, and I would make a big distinction between visualizing data once, like drawing a bar chart, even if it's the bar chart is maybe dynamically driven or something like that. But there's a, there's a whole other sort of level of things where you start to have physics engines in the background and you start to have animation transitions and so on. And if anybody's interested, I can post some example links 
from people who've done really, really good work on this. In fact, I should have had one open in my, uh, my browser here, but anyway, um, I'll dig it up later. The point is you can do quite complicated uh, user interface-ish kind of things. Uh, and the, the, there are ways of, surf, of treating the same data. And multi, you know, obviously, there's very simple ways that you can imagine. You have switches on, on switches even on a, on a bar chart that show you grouped by month or grouped by week or you know, um, broken down in some way, all that kind of Tableau software kind of thing. But there's also much more uh, visualization of much more complicated things. Anyway, so there's a lot of stuff in visualization. I will post some links uh, either in the chat or um, somewhere else in the readme in this for people who want to want to crack a book on it and so on. There's some fairly definitive books on it. Um, but I mean, let's if I just leap into what this library is, then is uh, it's an attempt to wrap type with types and make a decent stab at rabbit, wrapping uh, the D3 core, the, the libraries that are necessary for me to do these demos. Um, I'm not wrapping everything at this time. Uh, what I want to do is, is sort of show the possibilities. So without any further ado, if you, if you build it, you get five demos, right? That's all I had time to do this week, really. Uh, here's about the simplest possible thing you can have. You can take an SVG and you can bang four circles. Circles are SVG elements. In, in, you know, it could be the DOM and you could be putting paragraph elements in. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. But you're down here on, this, on these lines 23, 24, 25. I don't know if you can see them, but they're in, that, in the, the gist that's on that. You're, the, you've, you've, achieved, you've got a selection of something in the DOM. You've selected SVG, something with dot .SVG. You've appended a G to it, which is a, a grouping element in SVG. And then you select the, this line here, 23. You're, I'll explain the syntax in a minute, but you're, you're selecting circles, but there are no circles yet. Sort of fundamental concept. You're, say, you're saying, here's where the circles are going to go. We're selecting, it's a, it's a selection that's to be filled in. You bind some data to it. Uh, and now this is, in, in this version, in this PureScript version, this is type data. So it's a type selection. And then you enter, uh, that you're now sticking things into the DOM and specifically you're going to append a circle. And what happens is you had five points in the data and now you have five circles in the DOM, in the, in the SVG in the DOM. And in D3v4, that could be a canvas or SVG. You can target either one. And in fact, D, D3 is completely neutral about whether you're, you know, whether you're interacting with HTML or like ordinary HTML or, or um, SVG or Canvas. It really doesn't care. What it cares about is this business of, of uh, binding the data and then tracking it. So um, uh, any questions so far? Or I mean, does that make, is that teaching grandmas to suck eggs or is it over everyone's head? What are we, are we at that? I think that makes um, sense. Thanks. Okay. Um, so if you've ever seen, if you've ever seen D3 in, Java, in JavaScript, it, it looks a lot like this. Um, what Tom Crockett did was to just make this operator, which is uh, apply flipped, uh, which enables you to, so you, when you're doing that, you're, you've got, you're taking this function select all and you're applying it to circle and this G, and the G is a previous selection. So it's just, it's just a way of mirroring the syntax of D3. And then the double dot is just a regular bind. Uh, so this is, you know, what you have as a chain in JavaScript is a monadic uh, construct in, in PureScript. And it, so these are just stuffing one selection, one selection and selection and selection, affecting it all the way through. Okay, um, I think I'll show, go back and I'll go through these demos and then just then talk about stuff. So next demo, this is where it gets more interesting. So I don't know if this animation is gonna come across, but um, what you're seeing here, and it's worth running this animation yourself and having a look at it. What you're seeing is the 
the essential pattern of T3, which is new data comes in and the new data is, the, using CSS in when it's, um, if it's retained on the next step, in other words, if in this, this, when we're dropping random letter, random words in here, if the letters are letters that were already there, then they're going to be restyled to be black. And then the letters that are going away are styled to be red and they drop out to the bottom. So I, mean, I think this, um, was that visible? Was the animation visible at all? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty impressive. So uh, this, is, um, this, this is really, you can do a lot with this stuff. I mean, a lot, a lot. Uh, <laughs> Uh, just with that, selections and transitions, uh, you, if you add some events, um, you can make a lot of things happen. You can make a lot of things in data much, much clearer. Um, I think, if you bear with me for a second, I'll, I'll find this other. So if I look for Simpsons Paradox, Simpsons Paradox D3, there's a couple of guys in San Francisco who, did, who have a D3 consulting company. And they did this. If it'll load. So um, this I'll post the link to this in the, in the chat now in a second. But this is all all this data that's here is all integrated one with another. Uh, but you see that what I want to draw your attention to is this this graphic here with the groups of the groups of dots. Um, they're showing a complicated statistical idea. And they do it by phase transitions from, there's different cohorts of the data. And they do it in two phases because what they're talking about is the difference in, in um, uh, biases in hiring. Uh, anyway, they lead, you see it's a three-part, or the, it has an intermediate state, which is the, the two bubble, two groups together. This sort of stuff is really easy to do in D3. I mean, D3 gives you a language for talking about this kind of thing. So, um, although this example here, pure, where the general update pattern, although it's quite a simple thing, uh, you can, if you stare at that for long enough, you actually realize it's a tool for a lot of, with a lot of power. Um, okay, so next, I'll just talk about some of the other things here. So, force layout is, uh, using kind of physics engine stuff behind the scenes, particle uh, things. It has, you can add a bunch of forces onto a simulation. So if I just draw your attention to the, in the code, and this is, I have a link in each of these demos, there's a link to the JavaScript program that they're based on. I mean, they're, I didn't make these up, I just shamelessly stole them. Um, but so on these lines, 61, 62, 63, 64, we're making a simulation and then we're adding forces to it. Um, so there are different types of forces. So then you can produce different things. And uh, something like this centering force can be used. You can drop a centering force somewhere and then that will attract things to it, attract or maybe attract only a certain category of data to it. But so you can, you can design things and have a kind of emergent behavior on quite complicated, uh, uh, ID, uh, quite complicated data. Um, so that's, that's force layout. And then uh, I go back and we'll, we'll have a look at bar chart. Um, bar chart's not running. No, it must be running. Why is it not running? Demo effect. Oh, there we go. I don't know, I don't know what happened there. But um, I think the thing about bar charts is they're very, very boring, but uh, Actually, the complicated stuff that D3 does is all about scales. Uh, scaling is like where you go wrong and make terrible errors and cause planes to crash and stuff if you don't, you know, if you don't scale your data right. Um, and there's a whole lot of different ideas and ways of treating scales. And I, because I don't work with numeric data, this is really kind of a black box to me. I, when I started uh, wrapping this part of the library, I was learning as I was doing it because I don't know anything about it. But so there's there's, there's a whole bunch of what I, what I want to say about this is that there's a whole bunch of knowledge encoded in D3 
that's available to people who are you know who haven't studied visualization and who don't know the backgrounds on on the, maybe all the traps that are there and in, in how you scale data or how you uh, how you deal with missing data or how you deal with uh, statistical anomalies or you know there's a lot of knowledge encoded in there but there's then there's a big problem it's written in javascript and um it's like i have a huge admiration for for mike bostock it's like the guy has such incredible energy and, and generosity to to do this library but many 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 times re working with this i've i've felt that a bunch of pure script or haskell types essentially ml types would tell me more than the documentation that's there. Even the documentation's great, but uh, you know, like, so there are functions which are polymorphic in number of parameters, what they do if they get different types of parameters in their multivariate number, uh, what, they, what they return is different. Um, yeah, your, your ability to look at a function and say what it's going to do, to do any kind of reasoning about it is very limited. And so I, my thinking is uh, that there's something in this, like there really is some potential to do something in, in PureScript uh, that levels that up a bit. Um, and I further think that it's quite possible that people like, um, some of the people in this call, like Phil or, or Gary or whatever, might well look at the kind of models that are in there, the, the, um, look at the patterns that are in D3 and say, oh, but this is obviously a such and such, or that's a contravariant that, and this is a, you know, I don't know, applicative that or whatever. And, and there may well be uh, like mathematical abstractions that are in that library or should be in that library that aren't there. So that's, that, that I think is a really interesting area, not so much for research, but for actually um, generating new, really interesting stuff. Um, I wanna just say, like in terms of uh, demos, this, this is not a, like a finished demo, this is just stuff I was writing, but it does have one, it's really ugly as well, it's like Microsoft stuff from the 1980s. But um, there's just one thing on this that's interesting, which is that I do have the Zoom, and pan and drag implemented for this little section, these little five circles. I just didn't get a chance. I wanted to do that as, a, as one of these standalone demos. I just didn't get a chance to. Um, but I think that when you put those things together, um, you, there's quite a grammar of stuff. And it's quite, a, quite an interesting grammar for writing, writing programs. Um, so that's a little tour over what I did and what you would get if you download the, the repo and, and use it. I, I think at this point, I'd rather just have questions on this. Uh, or, or so I have a, a pretty basic question. Um, yes. Just how do you like the uh, the syntax and the operators that you have right now with the, the double dot? Because uh, I saw that was in the original version as well. Um, and I was kind of curious how that compared to regular monadic you know, do notation, or I guess uh, there's the Clisley composition operator for the double dot, right? So just if you had any thoughts on that. Well, my, yeah, um, my, my initial thoughts, like I said, when I first saw it, I thought this is brilliant. You can actually write, you know, functional programming and you could just translate. And, and that is certainly an advantage that you can kind of just look at something written in D3. And maybe I should mention that D3 has the most astonishing uh, demo world or demo system, uh, the blocks.org stuff, where you it, you can clone and fork visualizations, and there's like literally eighty thousand demos, um, and a lot of them are really good things. It's not just I mean it's not just crap. Um, so my initial thought was, oh that's great, uh, this is this is a brilliant idea, but now I'm not so sure. Um, I kind of feel that that there might be a much cleaner syntax for talking about these ideas um, that's that's available to us in in pure script um, I, I, so I, I guess I'm not hung up on on that idea I, I, maybe I should say just one one thing here is that there is I say this in my readme but like um, 
so some of the way some of the typing gets in here um, is you know by by introducing so if there are functions that are polymorphic in the parameter types, then I'm abstracting that with ADTs, which um, makes the thing a little noisier than it would be in JavaScript. But I mean, I think that's a reasonable trade-off because you're saying clearly what you want to do. Um, I, so I, if the short answer to your question, though, is I'm no longer completely convinced, and I would absolutely love to see someone uh, suggest some other syntax. And if someone comes up with stuff that's good, or someone's, or various people, or if there's work done on that, or suggestions made, I'm absolutely happy to, uh, I would put in the time to just strip all this out and or park this and fork it again and do the, do a different syntax. Because I actually just, quite like the syntax. Uh, I was just curious because, you know, obviously, um, if you use sort of do notation and things like that, um, you get a lot of nice operators for free. Uh, not that you like traverse and, and whatnot. Not, not that you don't really get them this way. It's just, um, it seems like this is more like punning on the dot notation, right? And like, you sort of get into yes. the subject mindset, so it might not be so obvious how to do those things. Well, you know, I'm not, I'm by no means an expert uh, functional programmer. And so, like, like I said, especially when it gets into trying to, like, I had a lot of problems with, with understanding, I mean, understanding when I needed to, to when I was in an effect and when I wasn't, when I, I don't know why that is, I just a mental block is like why I would need a pure here and there. Not. Um, One thing, uh, just a thought. I couldn't even answer for you right now. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You sorry. You broke up a little bit there for me. Um, oh, I was just saying. One one thought. Uh, you could actually uh, use a single dot where, where you have double dot right now. You might actually be able to use a single dot because um, single. Oh wait, no. I'm sorry. Because uh, we don't use dot, do we? We use uh, <laughs> three the three arrow symbol, so that wouldn't work. But uh, well, be. you would be able to use a dot, right? Because it's uh, like a Kleisley category or something. But never mind. Yeah, I mean, that for me is, I, I would say, like one of, the, one of the thoughts that I had when I was doing this is, um, <coughs> you know, D3 is accessible to people with very little JavaScript experience. It's, it's a gateway drug for, for JavaScript because you come into it with an idea for maybe your information design or whatever. I mean, there are people who, who learn JavaScript because they're interested in visualizing data and the D3 exists. And so they're in college, they're doing a course in visualization and they, that's what they, they're going to do. And they may know nothing about programming. And um, I was sort of thinking that we could arrive at something that, that was a little bit like that, but the type system is just too unforgiving to really, I, I, I don't really believe anymore that, mm, that some complete novice could do stuff with, with a DSL in, in D3. I think you have to be a functional programmer. Now, it's time to be corrected on that, but I just think that like error messages and so on, when you get something wrong, are completely, dis they're disorienting to me and I know a little bit about functional programming. I think someone who's not a programmer would just be, you know, throw up their hands. Yeah, so I uh, think the quality of the error messages depends quite a lot on how much overloading you use, right? So maybe this is one of those cases where it pays to sort of build a sort of, you know, custom prelude or something and sort of really build your own abstractions. Um, so yeah, maybe using those type classes uh, too much would be a bad thing even. Um, but. Yeah, I took out a lot of the type classes, by the way. Like, um, I just didn't see that that was, and I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I mean, part of what I was trying to do here was see how far I could go with a sort of, a, 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 a more um, rigorous approach than the previous PureScript D3. Um, and it turns out that you can do everything, but not everything looks pretty. So, I mean, if I show you what, uh, if you look in se selection, um, like this is what the callback function looks like for, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I, I that's not going to horrify you. It's not going to horrify people who've written halogen or whatever, but I think it would horrify most. Uh, it horrifies me a little bit. So, you know, that's, that's what's necessary to, to, to make a callback, a custom version of the wrapper to, in order to take the this 
pointer and bundle it into the three, you know, because this is, this is sort of typical idiomatic JavaScript. Oh, I'm calling you, but I'm calling you with the this set to something or other. You know, so. Yeah, that's interesting. Maybe uh, instead of using, well, I, I don't know, I think there's a few options, right? Maybe records would be uh, something useful as well. Um, if you had things with lots of arguments, maybe. But the, the, you know, this pointers are always tricky, right? So. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, this might be a horrendous way to do it, but uh, I just wrote my own, like, callback sort of, uh, I think this is it here, although, yeah, well, it's, that's it there, right? Um, oh, that's it, sorry, no, this is the one. So, yeah, I, I had to actually, in order to get my pucks channel in there as well, I was actually, in, in my commercial work, I was stuffing the pucks channel into the HTML data and retrieving it with, with D3, which is kind of gross, but it worked. Um, you know, I, and, um, Anyway, so this is you know th th there's a this is making a callback with with uh, this pointer bundled in it's, you know whatever has to whatever you have to do to get it to work but so I mean, in that like case, that is necessary. Go on, sorry. Uh, sorry, just just to say that um, you're using the, the PureScripts f functions or so, and I seem to recall some discussion with Harry about uh, the potential for having to handle this in some sort of wrapping some JavaScript libraries. So potentially some of that could be extracted if there's a more yeah. deep specific pattern. Yeah, that brings up an interesting point is that one of my other goals here was to try and sit within, when I said rigorous, what I mean is also like not, not rewriting events or anything and trying to, trying to be sure to use pure script libraries everywhere. Uh, because I think there's a fair amount of D3 that isn't of interest to pure script. You know, I mean, we may, maybe there's some needs where you need to use the collections that are in D3 because they handle things like, uh, well, they handle concepts like missing data, you know, because they have, you have dirty data when you're in the real world. Uh, but mind you, uh, maybe those things are worth uh, wrapping at some point in, in D3, not wrapping in D3, but implementing in D3 libraries because they're interesting concepts. Um, but certainly using uh, effectful functions was a huge deal. And I, I, I uh, utterly impossible without that. And uh, I did think about, yeah, some of those things could be PR'd back in, but I didn't, I didn't really see any general, I, what I was doing wasn't general enough, I think, uh, may, but maybe it would help someone to see what's the general case. Like, it would be one of the cases that would show you what would be general. I, the other thing I thought is that the effectful function stuff, uh, oh man, we could really use some tooling to be kind of writing it all in parallel somehow. You know what I mean? We, uh, we started a little bit of work to generate things like that from uh, web IDL files. Uh, we've talked about doing TypeScript bindings in the past, but that's a little tricky. Um, but yeah, I, I would like to have some tool to, to generate uh, things using libraries like F functions, definitely. You know, I, I even, I could even be, I don't know. I just, you, it just, it, on the other hand, it's very, it's very boilerplate as you, you can, you know, and it's kind of you can it's not that hard to write so maybe it's not such a big deal it just um in any case this all ends up in a library so ordinary people don't have to deal with it i think that the more the more tricky questions are about the actual dsl like uh especially whether like i i, I should there might must be some like here's here's something you know i have uh i have a fa I, I, i've decided to make drags have a type but then i discover that you know um that's just going to be impossible. You're dragging something different from the data. The data is typed on the, um, I think the data is typed on the container and you're dragging on the X and Y part of it. Anyway, so I end up coercing it away. That's probably the only unsafe course that's in it, but it's still, it's just stupid. So that there, there's two do's littered all over this code, you know, to do's and for discussion and so on. But, um, I have one uh, sort of related question to my last one. Um, this is mostly because I don't know very much about the internals of D3 uh, and sort of how much, um, well, so the question is, uh, do you, using sort of these pure script abstractions, and you know these uh, various types of compositions all have a cost, right? Do you notice a performance? Um, oh, it's a good question. It's a really good question. Um, one of the things that attracted me to it is the fact that I don't think you're going to have a performance impact because uh, the, 
the number of times you cross the FFI line are not usually very uh, often. Like they're not in tight loop kind of situations because what the, the operations you're doing are fundamental, fundamentally databasey kind of operations. You're doing selects and joins and uh, things, and they're all happening uh, in D3 and away from you. And yeah, that's why I was curious about actually whether D3 is sort of because um, obviously you're not sort of directly manipulating this. So D3 hopefully has an opportunity to sort of pre-compile some of this stuff away, right? Um, in which case uh, you hopefully wouldn't get a performance. Yeah, for, I mean, in, in, like, let's look at um, like this thing, for example, if there are 10 million of these nodes here, um, this, well, entering those nodes into the, into the SVG, and by the way, I, in, in the commercial work I'm doing, we've put in several, you know, probably 50,000 elements, SVG elements, maybe 100,000, I don't know, I, it's not, and it's not slow. Um, but. Well, that isn't with pure script D3, I, I, but that's with, with regular D3. But the, I have no reason to believe it would be massively slowed down because you take a big chunk of data and you say to D3, this is your data. And then you say, with one other call or two or three other calls, you're saying, and I, I want you to represent, to turn that data using this key function, I want you to turn it into um, you know, circles or boxes or triangles. Now, uh, where there would be stuff going back and forward for every datum, is all these like little functions, these little lambdas that are in here, uh, those could be expensive because that is turning into, that's going through the effectful function interface now. Um, I see, that makes sense. Yeah. Nice, but nice I, think, I think there's horses for courses and this kind of thing. I mean, I think one of the things is you might want to develop it rapidly Maybe you then take that out and write that in JavaScript or something. I don't know if I like that idea, but yeah. Um, but anyway, the, the, the central part, this part here, select, bind, and enter, that's all, those are individual calls, just one call for no matter how much data you have, and that's it done. Interesting, thanks. There's a question here in the chat. Do you think it's more ideal to wrap D3 or implement a new DSL? Um, that's a question that I really, uh, I, I'm, uh, I, I'm torn on that. Um, I think it was good for me to wrap D3, uh, and I think this is probably usable. Like I think, uh, I think this is this is pretty usable if you wanted to produce at least things that look like the, the five demos I've got. And I'll probably extend that and do, you know, I'd like to do like some of the really nice visualizations uh, like um, Sankey diagrams, which are flows, of, um, flows that split up or, and um, uh, a kind of chord diagrams, which are around a circle, collection, connections through a circle. Um, so I think it's useful. I do have the intuition that somebody, perhaps it would have to be somebody who's very much in both worlds, uh, I don't know if there is anybody like that, uh, but I think somebody could potentially, there's no reason why somebody couldn't come up with a much better DSL in D3, I mean, in, in PureScript for, for the D3 visualization stuff. I mean, D3 itself is the third go that Mike Bostock has had at writing a visualization library. That's one of the reasons why it's rich and why it's had so much success. He actually did two other visualization libraries and he worked at the New York Times for a couple of years as a consultant uh, doing visualizations of all kinds of things. And they did a lot of very innovative visualizations that were new ideas of representation. So um, I think it's a very rich library for that reason that it's, it's been around the thing, but I think you could, um, my, so again, from the comment, it seems to mirror the D3 syntax, which could have its advantages. I mean, uh, if you're somewhat familiar with D3, but I, with, with PureScript, but I don't think a JavaScript programmer would be able to just say, oh, you know what, I'm, I've done stuff in D3 and now I'm gonna do it, and I'm gonna learn PureScript and write, and write my D3 in PureScript at the same time. I think that might be a bit, I don't know. Some people find it easier than others, so. But it's very, it'd be really interesting if we could have the strength of types. I mean, it's, especially when you get into complicated data, like complex data, really complex data, having the clarity of thought about that typing, that strong types give you about what you're doing 
just yeah, it, and for debugging and everything. I mean, just so much easier if you if you're if you're sending you know either's and maybe's and so on into D three rather than trying to remember uh, that this function can take it can take a string or a number or a thing that can be coerced to a string and it can optionally take a function or a number, <laughs> you know, uh, and it will do one of five different things. In that, I mean, that, that's horror. That's just horrible. 